Well, ablation has come to play an increasingly important role in uh, the management of patients with atrial fibrillation over the last 15 years or so. It's clear that uh, drugs and standard therapy offer very limited uh, symptomatic improvement. And therefore, currently, atrial fibrillation ablation is being offered to all patients who fail antiarrhythmic drug therapy and or who cannot tolerate antiarrhythmic drug therapy. So that's become a clearly a class one indication for castor ablation of atrial fibrillation. This is typically being offered in, uh, very freely in the highest success categories of patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, but should be considered and even may be considered in patients with persistent and even long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, particularly when they are non-responsive uh, to or intolerant to antiarrhythmic drug therapy um, as is uh, applied today. Now that's an important question. I think uh, part of my previous response uh, had an element of an answer there. Um, it, there, are, there is a small amount of data in the literature that suggests that first-line uh, castor ablation in selected patients offers better outcomes than uh, antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And I think uh, I would suggest that this be used in patients who are young, in patients who have or in whom we anticipate that antiarrhythmic drug therapy may be poorly tolerated. Also, another category of patients are those who have uh, concomitant bradycardia, which could be exacerbated by antiarrhythmic drugs, athletes who cannot tolerate uh, antiarrhythmic drug medications and their uh, performance limiting effects. And finally, some patients with left ventricular dysfunction or uh, contractile dysfunction attributable to atrial fibrillation, but below the threshold of symptoms suggestive of atrial fibrillation. I think these are all categories of patients in whom antiarrhythmic drug therapy may not necessarily address the underlying symptoms and or the underlying mechanism, and therefore castor ablation is, uh, is both a useful and an effective uh, therapy. The important caveat here is that patients must be aware that this is an invasive procedure and therefore does have a certain a small but finite amount of risk. I think over the years we've seen that, uh, that with RF energy, for example, uh, standardizing uh, uh, ablation lesion outcomes is, is very important. And therefore, what you saw was the transition from standard 4 millimeter tip for, to, to uh, an open irrigated tip catheter. And then the next big step has been the advent of uh, con real-time contact force sensing technology, which has allowed predictable and controllable uh, lesion formation. In, in taken in context with uh, a, a circumferential standardized ablation strategy to achieve PV isolation, this is achieving increasingly better and better results. Um, we do have medium and short term outcomes that have significantly improved with a lower number of acute pulmonary vein recoveries and dormant conduction recoveries. This has to be correlated in the future with better clinical outcomes, which I think um, there are there are multiple studies in which I think will provide uh, data in the in the upcoming years. There are other te balloon-based technologies, both uh, cryo increasingly as well as with radio frequency current, which promise to simplify and shorten the procedure of PVI isolation at least. And finally, there is the prospect, uh, an increasingly uh, possible prospect, that we may have an individualized tailored solution for patients with non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation where, uh, in fact, the geometry is not conducive to a balloon-based or a simplified solution. I think there are a number of technologies that are being evaluated, but I think my own take on this situation currently is that uh, we should be, and we are, in fact, in the process of optimizing what we have. In particular, real-time contact force sensing uh, has been developed only a few years ago. And we are still learning the best way uh, of using this information and of integrating it into our workflow in order to achieve durable um, and stable and uniform and rapid PV isolation. Uh, having said that, two areas where I think technology is moving forward but is not yet in the, in the routine field is uh, advanced mapping technology. Um, and finally, um, technology in order to monitor real-time development of lesion formation. This, the, the, the mapping technology would allow us to have an objective target for extra PV ablation um, and for an individualized tailored solution.
whereas the uh, lesion monitoring technology would allow us to have an objective correlate of all the various measures that we use to control and optimize lesion making.